morning and welcome to Unity Church of Practical Christianity's virtual version of our service. We're pleased that you're joining us here today. Today we'll be offering a meditation time in addition to our Sunday message, which will come from Reverend Nikki Quinton. Throughout the service, special music will be provided by Angela Rapon, our musical director, and Sailor Lynn. At the end of the service, we'll share some other ways that we're staying connected with you, our Unity family, during this time. Our mission at Unity Church is to realize and express our oneness with God. Our vision statement is that we are a loving, spiritual community where we teach, share, and express unity in all life. Now together, let's join in affirming our statement of being. Together. God is all, both invisible and visible. One presence, one mind, one power is all. This one that is all is perfect life, perfect love, and perfect substance. I am an individualized expression of God. I am ever one with this perfect life, perfect love, and perfect substance. Today's daily word is faith. I invest my faith only in possibilities for good. The parable of the talents in the Gospel of Matthew tells the story of a wealthy man entrusting sums of money to three of his servants before leaving on a journey. When the man returns, he praises and rewards the two servants who, through wise investments, have doubled the funds entrusted to them. A third servant who, acting in fear, hid the money entrusted to him, receives no reward. The divine faculty of faith that is part of my spiritual inheritance is more valuable than money. I invest my faith wisely by believing and trusting that possibilities for good are present, even where good has not yet manifested, and I act on that belief. My positively directed faith brings rich rewards in consciousness. And from Matthew, chapter 25, verse 21. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Now for our meditation. As we begin our time of meditation, I invite you to get comfortable, to feel the support of your chair or the couch or the floor beneath you. Now I invite you to close your eyes and then to take a deep breath in and out and in. stronger 
by your loved ones. Feel yourself sending your love and light to them with the thoughts, may you be healthy and strong. May you be happy. May you be peaceful. May you feel loved. May you be healthy and strong. May you be happy. May you be peaceful. May you feel loved. in the flow of God's love and light requires that we both give and receive love, the latter sometimes being more difficult for us. And so now, still surrounded by your loved ones, imagine looking at yourself in a mirror. Look deeply into your eyes and see the precious child of God that you are. And now, allow yourself to send your love and light to yourself with the thoughts, may you be healthy and strong. May you be happy. May you be peaceful. May you feel love. May you be healthy and strong. May you be happy. May you be peaceful. May you feel love. Just feel that love and light within and through and all around you, connecting you to others, connecting you to God, connecting you to the essence of who you are. And as you feel yourself one with God's love and light, let your focus be on that abiding connection with spirit that is always present within you. You continue to breathe into this place where you and God are one. Feel that love and warmth and light radiating through every molecule of your being. As we approach the end of our time of meditation, continue to breathe in and out, taking whatever time you need to return to that chair or couch or floor, bringing with you the sure knowledge that you are surrounded by the light of God. You are light that you are enfolded by the love of God. You are love. And that light and love is forever and always the very essence of your being. And for that, we say thank you, God. Thank you and amen.
Good morning. Appreciate you uh, joining us today. I'm going to read from the book of First Kings, if you're following along with me at home, and the 17th chapter, starting with verse 8. This is in reference to the uh, to the beginning of the appearance and ministry of the prophet Elijah. And we'll begin reading in verse 8. The word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Elijah came on the scene during a time of an enormous drought and famine in Israel. And so uh, he arose and went to Zarephath, and he came to the gate of the city. Behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please get me a little water in a jar that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. <clears throat> but she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. Behold, I'm gathering a few sticks that I may go in, prepare for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. A very grim future, no doubt, that she saw. Uh, he said, if you have something to eat, I would appreciate it. She said, I got a little something, but uh, my son and I are going to eat it and we're going to die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go do as you have said, but make me a little bread cake from it first. Isn't that like a preacher? Yeah, just give me part of it. Yeah, you got it. Let's give me part of it. So do as you said, but make me a little bread cake from it first and bring it out to me. And afterward, you may make one for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. And she went and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and her, and her household ate for many days. The, the bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. And it's interesting, uh, Julianne had referenced this concerning how uh, you've been so faithful to help, you know, with your contributions, uh, your financial contributions during this time when we can't gather together, and we deeply appreciate that. And it's kind of, it's she's described it being like this, that, that it, it just hadn't emptied out. We've always, you know, had what we needed, and we are so thankful for that. Now, uh, in verse 17, it came about after these things, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick. And his sickness was so severe, there was no breath left in him. She said to Elijah, what have I done to you? What do I have to do with you, O man of God? You've come to me and bring iniquity to remembrance and put my son to death. And he said to her, give me your son. And he took him from her bosom and carried him to the upper room where he was living and laid him on his own bed. And he called to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, you have brought hast thou brought calamity to the widow with whom I am staying by causing her son to die? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's life return to him. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child returned to him, and he revived. And Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper room into the house, and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son is alive. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know you are a man of God, and the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. It, I think you would agree with me. This is, this is some good stuff he was doing. He'd just come on the scene, seemingly from out of nowhere, and already uh, he's performed a miraculous provision for this woman and her son. And he actually brought her son back to life from, from, from death. This is good. No one would deny that. But let's look in the, in the next chapter, in verse, uh, in verse 37, chapter 13, verse 37, where uh, Elijah continues his activities. He said, he's uh, at this point contending with, uh, with the prophets of uh, Baal which was the favored deity of the region. And uh, they were having a contest about whose God was the true one. And so uh, they decided, uh, Elijah said, I'll give you your shot. Uh, go ahead and, and appeal to your God. 
And uh, let's see what he does. And it said, verse 28, they cried with a loud voice, cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances till the blood gushed out on them. Came when midday was past, they raved till the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but no one, there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Nothing was happening. And then Elijah said, all right, you had your turn now, now it's my turn. And he actually uh, set up an altar with a sacrifice. He ordered the sacrifice of position there. Uh, he covered it with water, so much water that it filled up a trench that he dug around the sacrifice. And then he called on the Lord his God, who sent fire from heaven and consumed the sacrifice, dried up all the water, and made quite an extraordinary scene. And uh, so uh, Elijah said, I'll win. And he said in verse 37, Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know you, Lord, that thou, o Lord, art God, and thou hast turned your, their heart back again. The fire of the Lord fell, consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, and the dust, licked up the water that was in the trench. And all the people saw it, and they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah does something next, which does not seem entirely characteristic with a man of God that does good things. You notice in verse 40, Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal, do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and killed every one of them. And he was on such a streak of goodness that this sudden lapse where he actually slaughters approximately 450 prophets. This was bad. I think you would agree what he did before was very good. This is very bad. So what grade do we get Elijah? Because uh, he's definitely sending us some mixed signals here. And I want to talk to you about uh, making the grade this morning. Because uh, you determine what grade does Elijah get? He was doing so good and then done something that seemingly negated everything good that he'd done. What grade does he get? Making the grade. You know, uh, we in unity believe there is only one presence and one power in our lives and in the universe, God the good. We believe the force of the universe is good omnipotent. But what about evil? What about the nature of evil? What do we, what do we believe about that? Well, uh, what we believe in unity is that evil does not technically exist. You say, what? So that, that, you see uh, evil, what, what appears to be evil things all around us. How can you say it doesn't exist? Well, it doesn't exist as a force. Because there's one force, God the good, omnipotent. Now, the nature of evil, or what we call evil, and uh, evil has been magnified to such an extent in the religious world that many of our friends have even personified it and uh, made it the devil, that an actual person personifying evil in the world exists. Uh, my background, we call it the devil. Because, you know, we, we tend to elevate that person and that force. But I want to show you that evil no, uh, does not exist any more than cold exists. Uh, you might not be aware of this, but it's interesting. Cold does not exist, technically speaking. Cold is simply the absence of heat energy. Because heat is, a, is the clashing of atoms that creates energy. Cold is simply the absence of that energy. So evil does not exist in the same way that cold does not exist. Because evil, uh, if what we call evil is the absence of good. What we call cold is the absence of heat. When we're measuring a, a temperature, we're actually measuring what heat is present, not what cold is present. And so, and so, uh, we, we need to understand that there's one force active in the world, and it is the force of good, and it is the force of God. In measuring uh, temperature, for example, uh, there's, a, there's a, a measurement scientists call absolute zero. 
where atoms no longer have energy and they stop moving completely. This is said to be physically impossible and they've never achieved it. And so we gotta reflect with people that appear to be bad. Are they completely bad? Is there any good in them at all? Is anyone completely devoid of good? I want to submit to you that I don't believe that's the case. And I want to help you to see that we need not fear the force of evil, but we need to, as, as the scripture says, overcome evil with good. Because you see, at absolute zero, atoms have no energy and they stop moving completely. We measure how much heat energy available. And I submit to you, the measure is how much good is occupying the world, how much good is occupying the person, not how much bad. Jesus gave a metric for this in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. Listen to this. Therefore, however you want people to treat you, so treat them, for this is the law and the prophets. This is the metric. This is the measurement. The thermometer, if you will, for the heat energy of love is, is again, what he said, what, how you want people to treat you, so treat them. This is the law and the prophets. This is the sum total. This is the ultimate measure of what this thing is all about. And by that measurement, you see, it's by this measurement of positive energy, how you want people to treat you, so you treat them. The love of neighbor is the measurement whereby we find that the force of good is the force that exists. Evil is simply a lack of good being present. And so we see people, they, they, they don't know they've got the divine energy within them. They're not aware of it. And so in some people that energy doesn't manifest because they're not aware of it. Uh, Charles Fillmore said that that evil technically does not exist at a, as a force, but rather it is a lack of understanding. It is ignorance of the goodness that dwells within. And I want to submit to you that is definitely the case. How do we measure? How do we measure our lives? We measure it by this measurement. How we are interacting with our brothers and sisters in the world and treating people as we would like to be treated. I want to submit to you, if I were to tell you about, about a certain man, uh, he came of a family with a, he had an abusive father, a very loving, doting mother, who, uh, he, whom he adored. He was highly decorated in the First World War and subsequently came to a place of leadership in his country where he was able to revitalize the national economy and uh, it was reported by those around him he loved dogs and children. And I think you would say probably at this point, sound like a decent guy. His name was Adolf Hitler. And no matter what good things might have existed in his life at some point, the crimes he committed cancel out, in our minds, any, any trace of good. Was there good in Adolf Hitler? Yes, God put some there. But he definitely was ignorant of it, and he definitely didn't let it come forth. And his crimes cancel out any chance of him getting a good grade from humanity. I recall some time back, uh, my hero, my idol, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. There was an attempt to discredit him because it was determined that in his doctoral dissertation, he had not cited a reference and technically committed plagiarism. And so there was a, oh, well, he wasn't really a doctor. He didn't really earn his degree. And I thought to myself, so what? I can't tell you how little I care about that, and I'm sure you feel the same way. This man changed the world he lived in and ultimately uh, the, the world for future generations. He, his, uh, his work marked the, uh, ultimately the death of Jim Crow segregation in the United States. Enormous things, even and gave his life for his love for humanity. And to think that it would matter that he failed to cite a reference in his doctoral dissertation just doesn't compare to me, does it to you? To me, it's as absurd as, you know, some, oh, yeah, well, he did all that great stuff, but he didn't cite that reference in his paper. 
It'd be like saying a concern, concern Hitler. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, but he loved German kids and German dogs. There's no comparison. One man allowed the Christ within him to shine forth and transform the world. The other did not and brought destruction upon the world. You know, we need to grade ourselves by this measurement that Jesus talked about. Someone as well said we need to grade ourselves sternly, but grade others compassionately. And that's a good rule as a general rule, isn't it? Because what I see in myself, I see work to do, and I want to do it. It's not that I, that I want to beat myself up, but I do want to, you know, you know, you can do better. You can be a better person. Whereas I look at others, I, well, uh, they'll get it. Maybe I can help. Maybe I can love them into a greater place. Here at Unity, we're all about awakening people to the Christ within. And so it is. Amen. Angelo and Sailor, thank you for beautiful music. As we announced last Sunday, we will be returning to in-person services beginning in two weeks on Sunday, June 7th. In doing this, we will be adhering to the purposeful gathering guidelines and limits from the City of Memphis. This week, we will be providing details of exactly what this will look like in an email blast, posting it on our website and Facebook, and sending a mailer to our members and regular attendees. We're very excited about seeing your face in our space in a safe and cautious manner. We also want to just express how glad we are to have Reverend Mickey Quinton back with us and are grateful that he and Caroline are fully recovered from their bout with COVID-19. And now that he is back, Reverend Quinton will be moving forward in his capacity as associate minister, speaking on Sundays, offering prayer support and ministerial services. To learn more about Reverend Quinton, please visit our Meet Our Minister page on our newly formatted website. And finally, one of the many things we missed during the recent quarantine period was our spring building and grounds cleanup day in April. And due to this, our groundskeeping staff, staff are a little overwhelmed with keeping up with everything on our beautiful 12 acre property. So for those of you who have run out of things to do in your own yards, we need assistance cleaning up the planting beds around Isabel House and the area around the pavilion behind the main church building. If you have time and you're so inclined, you can please call or email the office and let us know when you plan to come up here to help with this during the week. If you do call, please leave a voicemail message and if you prefer to come on Saturday when Billy Dean will be here, you can do so from 9 to 11 to beat the heat. In the meantime, <clears throat> please continue to join us each Sunday at 1045 for our Facebook live stream of our weekly Sunday message. And we will be continuing to do that even as we move back to in-person services. We also invite you to engage in 10 or 15 minutes of daily conscious meditation with one another beginning virtually at 11 a.m. We will continue to live stream our own silent unity prayer service with the Reverend Crooks each Wednesday at 11, and we'll use this as our collective meditation time on Wednesdays. Remember that you can request prayers through our prayer request portal on our website and speaking of our website, please check out the We're All In This Together post on our events and activities page for resources to maintain connection and ideas for things that you can do while maintaining appropriate social distancing. Donations can be mailed into the church office or you can scroll down to the important announcement post on our Facebook page to find a link to donate or donations can be made online via our website on the ways to support our church page. We love you. We bless you. We behold the Christ in you. And we know that even apart, we are still all one. The light of God surrounds you. 
the love of God enfolds you. The love of God enfolds you. Yes. Yeah. 